Are we good? Cool. Welcome back from lunch break, everyone. Hope you're gonna be able to keep awake, but maybe it's a good idea to schedule this kind of industry talk, which is maybe a bit more relaxed uh, after the lunch break, so people can ease back into listening. Um, so the motivation for this talk, I guess, is to give people in the research community some insights into what may be the motivations, successes, and also the challenges when introducing reactive programming into uh, an actual big code base. Um, so why uh, the title of this talk, uh, Playful But Not a Toy? Well. like to activate caffeine but I, I can't because I can't reach it the screen is too small let's hope the screen doesn't turn off um, so uh, I picked this title because um, I work for this company Prezi we make this presentation software and uh, you can do certain things like you can zoom in to reveal that for some reason there's a skier going down the slope of Hawaii and you can rotate and then zoom out we're really not supposed to do these things just arbitrarily. So uh, you're supposed to use these things to provide context and to show kind of relationships in your content. And so while there's certainly an element of playfulness to Prezi, it's not intended to be a toy. And there's also a second sense, which is probably more relevant, in which it's not a toy. Uh, it's a big software project. So. Uh, I'm sure all of you uh, have a lot of experience trying out new ideas in research with some small examples, toy languages, and um, it's often interesting to see how things play out when you put them at scale. Um, so Prezi uh, is a multi-platform product, uh, so the viewer exists on many platforms, and there's also editors for and so uh, today, I think most of what I'll be talking about is motivated by our work on uh, creating editors for Prezi. So uh, in the editor, really what you do most of the time is you have to think about if the user does some kind of action, what does that mean? What has to happen in uh, reaction to that? And uh, it can mean actually many different things. So you may want to zoom, insert something, select, deselect, begin, close a path, nothing at all, or many more things. And why all these different options? Well, it's not arbitrary, but of course, it depends also on the state of the application at the time of the uh, occurrence of the event. So I think really at the core, what writing, especially an application like an editor, is all about is to manage this interaction between events and state. And when uh, we were starting a new software project, writing uh, an editor for the uh, browser platform, we had to consider, well, OK, what would be a good approach based on what we learned in the past to address this? So of course. Uh, one kind of obvious uh, thing in the JavaScript world is we heard about it a little bit today, is uh, callbacks or continuation passing style. It's not very popular. Um, one of the reasons is that when you write uh, code in this paradigm, it becomes kind of messy. Everything uh, shifts to the right in your editor. And uh, it's kind of hard to maintain. So can we fix this? Yes, we can by introducing an event bus and kind of shifting everything back and uh, flattening the call graph by introducing this indirection of the named event. Uh, so this is actually something that Prezi had experience with because the Flash editor is written in an event-based style, but it wasn't free of uh, difficulties. This is very unreadable. Did I pick a bad screen resolution, maybe? Did you change anything when you plugged in your computers? I'll, I'll go ahead, and I'll, I kind of know what it says. 
So uh, this uh, are some quotes from a post-mortem for a bug that we had in the editor. And um, it's saying in the description that undoing or redo uh, group object manipulation can cause inconsistent state, disaligned objects, involuntary changing arrangement, and possible content loss. So uh, this was kind of a severe bug and um, not something you uh, want to unleash on users. But actually this bug existed for, I think, uh, two years uh, in the application. And in analyzing the causes for this, uh, developers uh, said that the uh, code around this feature is infamous of being a hack, edge cases are not always covered, and features work accidentally and they, you're touching it. Uh, and this thing of feature working ac accidentally is especially bad in a cloud product because in something, say, 90s style uh, Adobe Photoshop, what you, what you can do is you have a long testing phase in which you kind of test and then you fix bugs and so you can kind of approximate a good enough solution to what you were originally tried to do. But in a cloud product, you want to ship continuously and it's not really acceptable to uh, introduce a lot of bugs. So uh, what's maybe uh, behind these difficulties? Um, there are uh, several things about uh, event handling code which make it difficult to um, write uh, applications at scale. So uh, one thing is that you construct this big dynamic flow graph where connections go in and out, and you have to do all of that manually. So uh, in here, the nodes are computational units, um, and the arrows are some kind of data flow. So that may be shared state, uh, but may also be um, data coming in through events. And uh, the dashed uh, edges are uh, representative of connections that may or may not be there. So through the lifetime of the application, these can come in and go out. Uh, similarly, the uh, dashed uh, nodes, those may be active or not, depending on some state of the application. So uh, in thinking about this um, a program constructed in this way, you basically have to simulate the evolution of the program during runtime if you want to reason about possible sources uh, for bugs. And it's also fairly easy to introduce uh, loops in this style, which you may not want to do. And it's very easy to end up having rest conditions because uh, you have to manually order the incoming events and incoming data and make sure that things are consistent as you process data. Uh, it also is often uh, problematic that with event handler code, you are kind of encouraged to write bad code. So uh, it's relatively difficult to uh, maintain encapsulation because all of your event handlers that are related around some feature may want to uh, see some shared state and uh, you have to s keep that somewhere and it's always easy to kind of litter out things you didn't uh, want anyone to see or to leak beyond really those uh, units that were supposed to look at it. Similarly, side effects uh, are often littered out across multiple handlers, um, and it becomes uh, difficult to really see at the core uh, what, uh, compri what, what uh, comprises one feature. Um, in general, uh, when working with uh, these event-based systems, you don't really have great primitives for building up abstractions. So uh, there's usually low uniformity in how um, the event handlers exist on the uh, different um, sources, and there's no common API that allows you to compose things easily. So while events uh, are usually something that are values, you don't really have a way um, traditionally to talk about event sequences or event sources in the same way. And so uh, when you have some kind of construction, uh, you may be forced to do that 
a new each case and can't do it uniformly and then just uh, give in values. So overall, uh, people at Pressy were looking for an alternative. And this 2012 paper somehow ended up in the hands of our CTO. It's a um, paper on Scala.react uh, by Martin Odetsky and Ingo Meyer from 2012. And they kind of <coughs> summarized a lot of the weaknesses of the event-based approach. And they proposed a uh, some flavor of uh, reactive programming as a remedy to that. And uh, people uh, at Pressy thought this sounded like a good idea. So this was actually what uh, was taken as the next step uh, from event-set uh, systems was to try a reactive approach for this new code base for the browser version. And reactive is kind of a buzzword. So what does it mean in our case? Um, so really, what we use mostly at Prezi at the moment is things in the Rx family. So there's reactive extensions originally coming out of C Sharp and Microsoft. Um, and really, this has evolved into a whole family of libraries for different languages, some community uh, maintained, some with support by Microsoft. And then there's also libraries which kind of are very inspired by Rx, even though they are not following exactly the same API. And we use Bacon.js, which is a JavaScript library similar to Rx and Reactive Coco, which is uh, for Mac and iOS development. Uh, but really, at the core, uh, what is happening there is um, if you look at the signature of uh, a function that allows you to register an event listener, uh, Rx kind of decomposes that into one um, the event handler. It uh, takes that as uh, observer of T's, and the uh, register is uh, looked at as um, observable of T's. So this is kind of the point where we reify the uh, event sequence into a value that we can work with. Um, so we go from this function, which allows us to register an event listener to uh, a value, a property that is uh, a sequence of events. And um, we get some things added which are not mentioned here. So you have better uh, <coughs> a better API for error handling and for completion of event sequences. Um, but really at the core, I think this is what Rx is about. And this allows you to now define uh, operations easily that work on these event sequences. So you can define a map operation, and you can define a merge operation, and all kinds of other more complicated operations, and work with that. Uh, we can look at an example. So this is kind of type scripty um, uh, syntax here. So we have three. Um, observables of multi events, and we want to uh, create a high level event from that which should be dragging. So we can do that by saying that for each uh, mouse down event, we will take mouse move events until we get a mouse up event. So this kind of allows us to have this um, bounded sequence of uh, mouse moves. And we can do this without having to manage any manual state. We just can write this as a one-liner. Uh, and a lot of things that we would, in the event-based model, have to uh, take care of and clean up is taken all, uh, care of for us here by the library. So uh, we get some nice things from this. We get a uniform API. It's uh, easy now to compose things. Um, and uh, we really have a much better grip, I think, on on composition of uh, higher level event logic. We also get better encapsulation. So uh, if we think of the uh, nodes with the same color as somehow being related to like one logical unit, where before we had to manage all of it manually, now we have bits that are managed by the library. So the library kind of encapsulates the state that we are not really interested in maintaining manually. It's also 
somewhat easier to be more explicit about a tag. So this is more of a convention than something that is enforced. But now you can have special stream operations that you use specifically when you want to perform side effects based on events. OK, so uh, this is nice. And people have to learn to use this. So there's a lot of material uh, out available on the internet. Uh, there are several books. This is a resource that I think originally was created by Netflix to train their um, engineers how to work in this uh, paradigm. And basically, it takes you from writing first imperative code, operating on sequences, to writing functional code, operating on sequences, so arrays in that case, and then kind of transfers that knowledge to uh, operating on observables. And that's great. So sometimes maybe people uh, are asking themselves, well, what do I do uh, in several different cases? Do I always, like, is, is observables always the right abstraction? Should I use uh, callbacks sometimes? Should I use promises sometimes? Um, should I just use pure functions sometimes? Uh, in the Rx community, uh, there's uh, a mantra uh, claiming that everything is a stream which, of course, that would uh, kind of simplify our ontology quite a bit. And so, OK, so let's go with that. So you learned the uh, uh, basics from the internet. You accepted that everything is a stream. And where before you had to do this kind of grunt work, drudgery, and you were unhappy, now with your new paradigm, everything is easy, and you have new energy. And everything is a stream, and you use this new magic tool. And then you sit back, and you watch things take their course. And then suddenly, you wake up, and everything is flooded, and everything is a stream. And uh, you find yourself in a big conundrum, and you have to worry, well, hope there's a, some wizard or consultant to uh, come in and fix things. So this is maybe a bit of a over dramatization of uh, what happened. But I think we made this mistake of uh, trusting too much into this Rx uh, approach. So there are some big claims out there. So uh, Rx is, is more than an API. It's a, it's a revolution in programming and so on. Uh, but I think you should really think about it mostly as a library because it does some great things for you, but it does not tell you how to architecture big applications. So really what I think uh, reactive extensions is great at is managing state in the small. So all these things where we have to create kind of auxiliary states to do some things um, in processing and combining our events, I think Rx is great at taking care of that. But it doesn't really tell you how to work with state in the large. So Rx still very much hooks into existing paradigms where it tries to operate, uh, interoperate with object-oriented code. It gives you these stream operations for uh, performing side effects. And it doesn't really give you a coherent story of how to think about state uh, in your application. But as your application grows, you want to uh, break out modules, and you want to break out units, and you have to think about how to deal with the legitimate state that these components have. And uh, at this point, you have this same problem. You don't have a unified API on your modules because nobody told you what that could be. Uh, you have to think about how to wire things up. And it really, uh, I think looking, looking back, so we, we, we were looking at three steps. We were looking at uh, callbacks, we're looking at event-based systems and this flavor of reactive systems. I think none of them really, at the core, uh, rethought how to manage state completely, but they all made it easier. So uh, each time, I think, you can work, you can build up a bit higher without getting into trouble. But if you keep building up, I think things still get difficult. Um, what I think... Uh, is something 
promising. So we, we're really not sure what the next step should be. But there are these um, promising projects which try to come up with some kind of answer to how should we think about state. And uh, one of those is Elm, which is uh, a programming language. We heard about it two days before. Um, that is developed by Adam Sublitsky. And it has a deceptively simple story of how to think about uh, state in your application and composition of modules uh, that have some notion of state. So for each module in what is called the Elm architecture, uh, you declare some type that describes uh, the uh, model. So that's going to be the state uh, for this module. Um, you uh, declare a type of possible events that are relevant to uh, the state in this module. And you uh, declare a step function that allows you to express the interaction between event and state. So uh, this is a pure function that only uh, updates your state um, depe uh, depending on the event it receives, but it, it will produce a new model. So uh, this is a um, pure function that won't alter anything you hand to it. And then for composing that, you uh, want to uh, you want to construct basically a top level model which is constructed of all of the modules uh, and you want to construct a top level stepper function which is constructed as a tree of all of the stepper functions of the modules. So <coughs> for, each, for each module that may be composed of some other modules you have a subtree and then you could keep building that up and really the only place that does manage state is uh, in the end, something at your top level where you um, use a top level stepper function, you use some initial state and you use a stream of incoming events and you fold over that in time to keep updating state. So there's really one thing only in your application that manages state. Uh, I realized last night that maybe it's actually helpful um, to think um, think of this as uh, the Sun King, uh, Louis XIV. So there's one thing in your application which says, I am the state. And it uh, has some legitimacy in, in claiming that. But really, it only <coughs> delegates to pure workers um, that do all the things that, that happen eventually. Um, there are other projects which kind of follow this uh, same set of ideas. So there's Re Redux, which uh, takes a lot of the uh, ideas of Elm and puts them into the context of um, JavaScript. I think this is used uh, quite a bit in the React, um, so Facebook's React community now. Um, it has this same basic idea. It cannot enforce all of the things that Elm can enforce, being that it's only a library for JavaScript, um, but uh, it seems to have some uptake recently. There's also Cycle.js. I'm less familiar with this, but I'm under the impression that it actually has some basic, uh, like it, it follows the same basic ideas, although it kind of models up everything into one main function. So you, you kind of don't distinguish things at the API level. But if you look at how this main function is uh, constructed, you see that uh, it does a similar thing where it does only pure data transformations. And I think it's kind of, in a way, a perspective shift from, I think, traditionally, FRP, at least as conceived in the 90s is very much about treating reactive values as data and uh, having functions operate on them. Whereas I think this uh, set of ideas is more about having the reactive domain as some sort of context and kind of embedding pure um, data transformations into that, which are not themselves uh, about streams or about events. And 
it seems not always obvious that everything we're interested in can easily be expressed in these kind of very restricted systems. But I think they have been surprisingly successful. And uh, I think that's also why there has been a lot of interest in ELM is that uh, it kind of shows that, well, if you make some restrictions <coughs> and keep things simple, you actually get some nice benefits out of that. So this is definitely something that I think could be considered as the next step up, though I think it's yet uh, open whether that is actually uh, going to be the next step or not. Um, that's it. Thanks. It's difficult. So, do you, but you mean in the RX world compared with the event space world? Uh, yeah. We can't really say because um, we can't compare. Like, we don't have a JavaScript code base with event based system <coughs> and reactive system. We only have a JavaScript code base with the reactive system. It hasn't really been a problem that we run into. So large parts of the application are written in a different style. So all of the graphics engine and so on uh, doesn't really use um, reactivity. So I think in the in kind of writing the Chrome for an editor, it's fast enough. into so <coughs> I was I was talking to Evan last week a bit and I, I kind of tried to construct the use case where it doesn't work um, but I couldn't really convincingly do that I somehow have this feeling like if you have a very dynamic um, system uh, you know like some so for example Elm doesn't really have something like flat map but Elm has a specific thing that allows you to basically do flat map. Um, but maybe there are other things uh, which would have to be special case as well or that you just couldn't do. Um, so one thing uh, I've been thinking about, like if you have a graphics application with filters and you would want to express those in terms of reactivity, you kind of have filters coming in and out. Uh, so you would maybe change things. But yeah, as I said, so I, I've been trying to construct something and it's more a uh, kind of worry that there might be something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 I don't really know enough about how that input works, but maybe can you point me to that later? No, not currently. So uh, this uh, whole project started at a point where Elm was not really uh, production ready. I think now uh, things would be different. But now we have a large existing code base, and uh, it's not easy to switch on. Um, so could you go back to the slide with both feet on? With what? Both feet? So yeah, there's only one, one FRP primitive left in your entire program, basically. Uh, that's right. You will probably have more. So this events thing uh, is a signal of some events. Yeah. And probably you did some processing to kind oh, of so, get so those. You're, you're only using like FRP to structure the input to Yeah, okay. yeah. <coughs> and the rest is conventional, conventional so basically. So basically, the logical transformations, I would call them, 
all of those are just pure functions. No, yeah. And what I don't show here that um, maybe your module also needs some side effect to happen. So uh, what is actually now part of um, of like most recent Elm is it may produce not only a model but also an effect, yeah. and that is something to be handed off to something that yeah. can perform like that the effect. Or or yeah, it's kind of yeah. Yeah. I think. I think. Uh, I think what the issue for us really is, is that we don't have a way to think about um, modular composition when using RX. Uh, so it's not actually. There's no claim that you can't do that with RX. Um, it's just that Rx alone won't, I think, like we haven't, we haven't found any explanation of how to uh, write applications to the last scale. You find a lot of examples of how to do similar to medium complexity things, but there's really not much out there talking about how you compose large scale things. And so I think what really, what I was saying, like what we, what we need to add is some kind of story of how to think about that. And um, we, we, we just don't get that from reactive extensions. Uh, we can use reactive extensions. So for example, CycleJS uses reactive extensions, but it also adds kind of an idea, like a unifying structure of how to compose your application. You don't seem. I think, I, so I think, I mean, on this whole uh, spectrum, we never have an Im impossibility of anything. It's just that as things grow and become more complex, it's easy to lose track of what's going on. It's very easy here. You can hold out a bit longer here, and you can hold out even a bit longer here. But it still happens like the same way. Like all of these are fine in theory. Like you can work with any of these, and you can write perfect code that you know like does things right it just becomes easier as you go up and i think we still need to make it easier yeah yeah so debugging is um, is pretty annoying. Um, so basically what most people use most of the time is insert loggers. So uh, that's actually something that's exposed on like bacon or reactive extensions all have some kind of uh, things that make it easier to intercept uh, what's going on. I think recently RxJS also um, introduced something that I think they call long stack traces. <coughs> which kind of collect, like they um, pass on extra meta information uh, through the stream processing. And you can use that in the case of an error to better understand what's going on. That's not very uh, efficient, but you can turn that on and off. So you can turn that on for debugging. Yeah. No, so we both, like we have both at this point. Um, but yeah, so the JavaScript code base is mostly a rewrite. Um, 
as for refactoring within the JavaScript code base. It's oh, that's what you mean. I guess we don't really have that experience. Yeah. Oh, I thought you you meant just if you have some code that is written in Reactive Paradigm and you want to refactor it. Uh, I think it's a bit easier than doing that in the evented uh, paradigm just because you have like better ways to find out who may be interested like listening uh, to something like this because instead of searching for some string you can actually search for something uh, using some method to register itself so you have better static analysis um, so persistence is actually soon what I'm saying is not true, but um, persistence is relatively straightforward. So we have most of the um, client, uh, so most of the editor is happening on the client side. And uh, this is uh, serialized as XML and stored uh, using a REST API. So we, we, we are working on um, uh, multi-user uh, editors, which you can collaborate with people in a like, remote session. Uh, and things become a bit more complicated, but I'm not familiar with that stuff. Um, All right. Thanks.